Elimination reactions are all well and good. And so you learned about alpha beta elimination. You learned about Hoffman product, Zeitzeff's product, and so on and so forth. You also know there is E1, E2. So now there are just a few things that are a little bit different about E1, E2 than from the substitution. So I want to go over uh, some of those considerations with you, okay, that you need to pay attention. The first consideration is regioselectivity. We're going to talk about two, regioselectivity and stereoselectivity. Regioselectivity I've already introduced to you is called the Zaitsev's rule. Zaitsev's rule is that the more stable alkene is going to be the major product. So in this case, E1 and E2, both of these have these considerations, okay, for Zaitsev's product. So it's not that regioselectivity is only for E1 or E2, it's for both, okay? So what are we looking at, okay, in this case? The main thing you're looking at, of course, as we did in the previous uh, presentation, is that you're looking for alpha, beta, right, elimination. So this is the alpha carbon, and then here is the beta 1, and let's say this is the beta 2 hydrogen, okay? So you have two kinds of hydrogens uh, available. Now, in this case, your halide is a secondary halide. A secondary halide, this hydrogen is accessible. This one is also fairly accessible, okay? So both of the beta hydrogens are accessible. And so therefore, if you get rid of B1 or the beta 1 hydrogen, this is the alkene that you get. If you get rid of beta 2, then this is the alkene that you get, okay? So this alkene is the Zaitsev's product. Why? Because this is more substituted. This is what we call terminal alkene, right? So terminal alkenes are generally not that stable. Internal alkenes are generally going to be more stable. So you don't have to think about more substitution or less substitution, okay? So internal alkenes are more stable than terminal. So this is the Zaitsev's product. This mechanism was E2 mechanism. Why is it an E2 mechanism? Because the halide is a secondary halide and the beta hydrogens are easy to access. In general, for E1 to happen, you will have a tertiary halide. Okay, so here is a tertiary halide. So this mechanism is going to be E1, all right? And in this case, if you have an E1, now remember these two methyl groups, they're exactly the same. So which means these two hydrogens are exactly the same. So if I say that, okay, I have to identify my uh, beta protons, this is beta one, this is also beta one because they're both the same kind. This is beta two, so this is a different one, okay? So these two here are what we call equivalent hydrogens and so they are not going to be different, okay? And so that's why you only get two products and not three products. So here, if you get elimination, this kind, you will get a terminal alkene, which is this one, and then beta two here, you will get this internal alkene. Again, internal alkene is going to be predominant. That's the major product. So Zaitsev's rule rules, okay? So you're going to have the more substituted alkene as your major product in regioselectivity, okay? When do you have regioselectivity? Again, you can have that in E1, E2. It doesn't matter, okay? So here, uh, yeah, this is the same thing, okay? That in E1, it's the, always going to be the most stable alkene. With E2, there is some things more that we have to look at sometimes, and as we learn more and more, um, you will see that it will be easier for you to make uh, your decisions, okay, a little bit because when we deal with certain kind of substrates, so for example, if you have a substrate like this, you know, where this is bromine over here, well, you know, this is a hydrogen, this is a beta hydrogen, this hydrogen is a little bit more sterically hindered. And then if you start using something like T-butoxide, which is a really bulky base, well, this is not going to be able to access this, okay, because this hydrogen is sterically hindered and this is a bulky base, so which means this base is going to go only for this one. So if it goes only for this hydrogen, then the only alkene you will get is the terminal alkene, which is the Hoffman product, okay? So in some cases, you can like target your product and say, okay, this is the only thing that I want. Uh, so this is possible, you know, with E2 it is possible. With E1 sometimes it's not possible because E1 is carbocation driven and there's nothing much you can do about that. But with E2, you can actually have a little bit more selectivity in saying, okay, I really want to have the Hoffman product and not the Zeitsafe's product, okay? So that's the uh, little bit of an advantage that you have for E2 
versus E1. E1, you will always get the Zeit saves product as the major product, always. So stereoselectivity, this is a little bit different concept and uh, we'll, you know, just kind of listen carefully as I'm going through with you and take notes or draw this as we are talking. Okay, so this will help you. This happens only in E2. This stereoselectivity does not happen in E1. E1 goes through the carbocation mechanism. It's a different thing. Okay, and let me just remind you again, E1 Carbocation means that the leaving group is gone. Okay, so in case of E2, things are happening at the same time. Remember, it's bimolecular. Okay, so I said to you before that look at where the hydrogen is, where the bromine is. So bromine and hydrogen have to be diagonally opposite to each other. I said to you that, okay, that this hydrogen is not going. Okay, this is the hydrogen that is required and that is what we call stereoselectivity because the relationship that you have of this hydrogen to this bromine is what we call anti-periplanar okay so when you have something that is anti-periplanar then that is how the elimination takes place so what does anti-periplanar mean if you look at this leaving group from this side this is your beautiful eye so if you look at it from this side the angle over here is actually 180, so which means that hydrogen is here, bromine is here. Okay, so the angle is 180. That is called anti-periplanar. So once you have something that is anti-periplanar, that is how elimination takes place. How do we know that? Because it's been tested. Okay, so if you have a hydrogen here, you remember your conformations, right? So if you have a hydrogen here or here, these hydrogens are not eliminated, only this hydrogen is eliminated. Okay, so that is anti-periplanar and that is stereoselectivity. So which means that your beta hydrogen and your alpha leaving group, they have to be anti-periplanar to each other. Okay, so now if you look at these hydrogens, these are completely anti to the chlorine. Now there are two ways you can look at the anti-beta uh, hydrogen. One is like drawing this. If you have a cyclic compound, in a cyclic compound, you remember that when we talked about hexagons or cyclohexane, so in case of cyclohexane, what did we do? We drew the chair conformation. In chair conformation, we had the axials and the equatorials, right? That's what we had. So that's something you can do. In the case of straight chain, in the straight chain, we drew out the Newman projection. So you can do that also and then determine uh, using conformations whether your hydrogen and your leaving group are going to be anti periplanar to each other. So those two ways are the ones that you can figure out. Okay. Now one thing I want to mention before I move on from this slide is that when you have something that is in a ring structure like uh, what, what is shown over here to you, in a cyclohexane the leaving group has to be axial. It has to be axial it cannot be equatorial. This is equatorial group, so it cannot be equatorial. Okay, so your leaving group has to be in the axial location, okay, in there. So if it is not axial, this reaction is not going to happen because in the axial location, you can have the total anti-periplanar. You can't have that so much in the equatorial, okay? So that's an important thing when you're looking at stereoselectivity. So let's look at an example over here, okay? So in this case, you have a cyclohexane <clears throat> and you have these, uh, you know, uh, this one is a cis one because if you have the two uh, groups going back, then hydrogens must be coming out, okay, over here. So this is what you have. And these are the products you are getting, okay, in this case. So let's go ahead and study why this is happening, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and draw out the uh, cyclohexane for you in the chair conformation. Now this right here is the propyl group and here is the chlorine group. So I'm just going to flip it because I like to start my leaving group over here as axial. Okay, so once I have that axial there and this is going up and this is a cis, which means that this propyl group, isopropyl group also has to go up. Okay, remember that. So cis means both going in the same direction. So I want my chlorine to be axial because my leaving group has to be axial. Now I'm going to go ahead and draw out my beta hydrogens and my beta hydrogens are going to be this one and 
Remember here, if this chlorine is going up, a hydrogen is going down, and then here you have another hydrogen, okay? Which hydrogens are going to go? The hydrogens that are going to go are this one and this one. Why those two? Because those are antiperiplanar to the leaving group, okay, over here. So that is how you see the two products, okay, that are forming. So at one point, what's going to happen is that this hydrogen is going to come over here, the chlorine is going to leave. At another point, this hydrogen is going to uh, drop its electrons over here and that chlorine is still going to leave. Okay, so once you have those kind of uh, eliminations going on, the purple one, the purple one is going to give you the double bond over here and the red one is going to give you the double bond over here. So let me go ahead and draw that out, okay? I know it's getting to be a little crampy up there, but let's go ahead and do this. So the propyl group is still there going up, okay? And then I have the double bond right here for one of them. And then in the other case, I still have the propyl going, group going up and then the double bond over here. This one where the double bond is next to the propyl group, is the first one. The double bond is away from the propyl group is this one. Okay, so this is this one, this is this one. That is how these two products came about. Okay, so you find the antiperiplanar hydrogen. So this is what happened when I started with the cis. So I'm going to go ahead and try it out with the trans now and see what happens. So in this case, this is my uh, trans relationship. And so, which means, and again, I'm going to draw my chlorine up here, okay, because I want my chlorine to be axial. And now the isopropyl group is in the opposite direction, so it means it's going down here because it's trans relationship. So one is going up, one is going down. Now I have to identify my beta hydrogens, and my beta hydrogens, one is here, which is equatorial, and the other one is here, which is axial. So axial, axial, antiperiplanar in opposite direction, that is the one that is going to leave. So this hydrogen is going to leave with its electrons, this hydrogen is going. This hydrogen is not going anywhere, okay, because this is equatorial and it is not antiperiplanar, okay, so that is not going anywhere. So which means that as a result, here is my propyl group and this is my product okay so you can see that the double bond is away from the propyl group one bond away and this of course as you can see by looking at the product this is actually Hoffman product the one that is up here this one this is the Zeitsafe's product so Zeitsafe's product is where the double bond is going to be uh, more substituted. So that's the Zeitsafe's product. So which means that if I started with something that was cis, I got two products. But if I started with trans, I only got one product. And now you can see why that is happening. And that is because of antiperiplanar hydrogen and the leaving group. So there are some more examples in my practice sheet. So make sure you, you go through those okay, to practice this. Um, and you can listen to this again in case you want to. I think I have a video also on this one. So here is the review for all the synthesis that you've done for um, a synthesis of an alkene. So alkenes are all elimination reactions. So you can do dehydrohalogenation, which is really removing H and then the, you know, any kind of halide. That's what we've been doing, alpha beta elimination. You can also do dehydration, which is for alcohols. Then you end up getting two kinds of product, the Zeitsafe's product and the Hoffman product. Zeitsafe's product is more stable alkene, so that's kind of what you end up getting. And then we just talked about the antiperiplanar uh, eliminations that occur in very specific conformations. Now, I gave you the example for a ring structure, but these kind of conformation problems happen even in straight chain compounds, okay? So when you draw the Newman project uh, projections, then you can see uh, if you have the antiperiplanar hydrogens or not. And then, of course, if you have an E1 kind of a mechanism, you're going to get rearrangements, okay? So this really kind of summarizes everything. 
So here are your conditions. Here is your beautiful table for E1 and E2. So here is E1, E2, mechanism first order. Second order rate is for E1 only on the substrate because you're forming a carbocation. So it is what we call unimolecular. E2 is going to be a bimolecular. Substrate should be a tertiary in case of E1. In case of E2, primary is okay. Secondary is also okay, all right, for uh, E2 mechanisms. For E1, you don't need such a strong base because you have a carbocation already. So you need a good base. It doesn't have to be super strong, but in case of E2, you need to really have a good base, okay, for this. The solvent, you need a polar solvent for E1. Non-polar solvent is fine for E2 because you're not forming any ions or anything like that. So there is a competition going on with E1 and SN1. We kind of talked about that a little bit. And so sometimes it's actually a very messy kind of a reaction to do. So you have to choose a good base in case you want to do elimination. If you want to do substitution, then you do solvolysis, something like that. Okay, and so E2 will compete with SN2, but then again, you choose your substrates and bases carefully so you can avoid side products okay that are going to happen so what kind of stereos uh, stereochemistry do we expect in e1 Zaitsev's product is going to be the major product all the time okay for e1 uh, for e2 you can decide what it's going to be because depending on the substrate okay so we just talked about the anti periplanar kind of a thing so sometimes you end up getting the Hoffman product when you know it's not the more stable so it depends okay on the substrate so this slide is kind of an important one and you can go over this yourself also because there's nothing new that I can talk over here. I can just re-emphasize some things for you that we've been talking about. What, what kind of things do you need for substitution? What kind of things do you need for elimination? So nucleophile for a substitution, you need a good nucleophile, okay? Um, so in a, you know for uh, for uh, sn1 you don't need a good nucleophile because it doesn't really matter but for elimination you need to have like a good nucleophile or a strong base for a substitution it's a good idea to go ahead and have a small um, nucleophile because it needs to access the electrophile for elimination it's a good idea to have a bulky one so that it doesn't access the electrophile it goes for the proton Okay, so it stays only in the periphery, it doesn't enter, you know, the carbon area. What kind of substrate do you need for substitution? Uh, primary, secondary substrates are really, really good for uh, substitution, for elimination, tertiaries are really good, okay, um, because tertiary, you know what you're going to get. Sometimes with E1, with E2 reactions, you know, things are not all that clear, okay, but also remember that higher temperature will give you more elimination, and that's really my clue for you for most part is I will write that something reaction is done in heat. And so once it's done at higher temperature, you know that you're promoting more elimination, okay, in those cases. So E2 versus SN2, when is it, you know, going to be favored? So for a tertiary halide and a bulky base, you're going to get E2, okay, because in a tertiary halide, uh, the carbon is not all that accessible. There is a lot of steric hindrance going on, and then you use a bulky base. So you're promoting more like an E2, okay, kind of a reaction. For E1 versus SN1, that's the one where things can get really dicey. So the best thing to do in those cases is to go ahead and heat the reaction. So that way you can promote elimination and not get so much of substitution. Okay. There's a little bit about halides also for you. Okay. So kind of just go through that. Make your table. Uh, I have some other things also. I have one other um, PowerPoint for you which can help you a little bit. Uh, generally, the, you know, the most important thing is to go through it step by step by step, okay? Like, what kind of substrate do I have? What kind of a nucleophile do I have, you know, and what kind of leaving group do I have? Uh, am I able to see the stereochemistry in the substrate, you know? Because if I show you stereochemistry in the substrate, I'm trying to probably give you a hint, okay, that maybe it's an SN2 and you need to show me stereochemistry. Uh, then you look for the temperature thing, you know, am I trying to tell you that you need to do elimination? In some cases, I'm flexible because, yeah, it's really hard to make up your mind, okay, what kind of reaction will happen, but so long you justify your answers to me, I am okay. 
So here are some other uh, examples, okay, for you for substitution and elimination, and you can go through this yourself. Let me know if you have any questions, okay, on this. And again, here are your keywords, not much going on here, nothing new to talk about. So let me know if you have any questions, okay? Send me an email or um, talk to me in class.